today we're going to talk about patience, okay? Um, as you came in outside, there actually was a piece of paper that maybe you got or maybe you didn't uh, to give you some notes that you could actually fill in, take home, study, and uh, kind of help you relate. Because when we start talking about patience and everything that's there, it's really talking about, you know, how, how, do I, how do I wait? You know, because when you start talking in the book of Proverbs chapter 16, in verse number 32, I've got uh, all the, the scriptures are actually here, they're on the sheet, because today I've got them in different versions of the Bible to kind of help hopefully understand and get the message across a, a, as to which one kind of looked pretty good with this. And so, in Proverbs 16, 32, it says this, it's better to be patient than powerful. It's better to win control over yourself than over whole cities. And when you begin to understand, I, I saw a, a sign the other day and it said, a man without patience is like a car without brakes. And when you think about it for a minute, you really don't want to drive your car around when the brakes are bad, especially if they've gone out and you don't have any. And so the same thing should be happening with your life. A lot of times people will say, God, I need to be more patient. And, and let me say this to you. Be careful. Because today you're going to find out what patience is really all about. And when I say this to you, I want you to understand something. Just because the way we get patience may not seem to be the way we want it, doesn't mean that, well, then I don't want patience. Because it's better to be patient than powerful. Proverbs 19 and 2 says this, impatience will get you into trouble. Impatience will get you into trouble. So, if we're going to talk about patient, then, okay, pastor, what's the secret to being patient? How do I get this? How do I develop more patience than what I've got? So you're telling me that we need this, so don't just tell me that I need it. Help bring it to me so I can understand. And so that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to break this down through the Bible. Because... When you start asking the question, what is the secret of, of learning to be patient? The answer to this is, you learn to cooperate with God. And sometimes you'll say, well, I'm cooperating with him. Really? Really? We'll see. Because you have to understand something. When you have patience... Patience is a twofold thing. Patience says, God, you have your part of this formula, and I have mine. So what is God's part? God's part is to provide the circumstances to help me to develop the patience. My response is to provide the right response. God's part is to provide the events, and our part is to provide the right attitude. And a lot of times, we're not giving the right attitude and the right response. God's doing his part, ladies and gentlemen, in helping us to develop, or helping to develop patience in us. But the problem is, our attitude and our response is what's wrong. And so many times, we want to put the blame on God, and that's not where the blame belongs. God's doing his part, has been doing his part, and as long as you're in this world, ladies and gentlemen, God will continue to do his part in working to give you patience. Okay? So, when we start talking about some opportunities, and 
Uh, you don't have to worry about writing these down right now because these I'm going to give them to you in a minute and, and you can get them. And, and so they're kind of a little and you can't read them, but that's okay. I can read them because I got my notes. Okay, so that's what's important. There are four types of interruption or, or four types of opportunities that God's going to give you and we're going to break these down in a minute. Number one is interruptions. Number two is inconveniences. Number three is irritations. And number four is inactivity. And so those all are God's part. Okay? They belong to him. Now, he provides the circumstances of interruptions, inconveniences, irritations, and activity. He provides circumstances for there. But then how do we react to those things? And so when we start talking about my response, my response is you've got to have a big, bigger perspective. And the problem is so many times what we want to do is we want a perspective of life that is mine. And ours is just a little, little bit of life out of the whole big picture. And so we need to understand, where do I fit into this bigger picture? We sometimes want to think that the world revolves around us, and the world doesn't revolve around us. We're just a smidget providing something for here. You develop a sense of humor. And this is one thing that most Christians don't have. And I'm not talking about ability to tell a joke, to be a stand-up comedian. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is this. When things happen in your life, if you can laugh at it, you can live with it. Why? Because the, Bi the Bible has told us that laughter is good medicine for the soul. But not only has the Bible told us this, doctors have now validated Scripture. Two things, two things that make people heal quicker with less pain. One is prayer. Two is humor or laughter. When you start giving up the enemy wins. We need to understand that number three is you need to deepen your love. Why? Remember what the Bible says? The Bible says that love is patient. Patient. So, if I'm developing patience, then ladies and gentlemen, that means I'm also going to develop my love. And can I, so let me say this to you. If love is patient, then do you also understand the converse of that? Which says, if I'm impatient, I'm unloving. If love is patient, then not being patient is not loving. This is what happens in a lot of marriages and other things in life. We get angry at the littlest thing. And it begins to fester and it grows. And then the next thing that happens is, I don't love them anymore. Why? You're, you're being unloving. And then another is I depend on the power of Jesus or I depend on God's power. Okay? So, in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, I'll give you this one. It's actually uh, on the bottom there of your first page. It says, is your life full of difficulties? Then be happy. For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. When your way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. Here's what happens. When things get rough in our life, fix it now. When God is saying, hold on a minute. 
This is why I say, be careful when you ask for patience. Because when you ask for patience, you're rough. Life is going to get rough. Why? Because life will get rough to give you a chance to grow in patience. When life is easy and you're up on a mountain, <laughs> it's easy to look at it from that perspective. But when you're deadly and life is hard, that's where we grow in the patience of God. So, let's start talking about these four kinds of opportunities. Okay? And, and, and so, when you look at the first one, it's called interruptions. And when you look at that, you say, okay, well, what in the world do you mean by children? Do you mean that children are an interruption to our life? Uh, some people believe that they are. Uh, some people whose children weren't planned, and then all of a sudden a child comes along, and, and they think, okay, now what am I going to do? I can't do this anymore. This is going to this is going to put a, time, a, a a damper on this and this and this and this and this because I can't do all of those things, and that's not what I'm talking about. But I am telling you that there are things in life that are interruptions. For instance. Have you ever sat down to eat? All day long, that phone has been silent. Nobody has called you. And every once in a while, you've put it to your ear and you've called somebody just to make sure it's still working. Right? And then all of a sudden, okay, let's, let's sit down and let's eat. And as soon as you sit down to eat, what happens? Whatever ringer you got on goes off. And what do you do? Hello, this is Chuck. Yeah, okay. While the rest of the family and everybody else is looking at you, and you're sitting here doing this, your food's getting cold, and everybody else is saying, can we go ahead and eat? Or do we have to wait? I, I mean, you're being rude by taking the call. So shouldn't we be rude and go ahead and eat without you? And most of the time what you get is, you're on your own, but I'm eating. <laughs> Me feeding my face is more important than you taking that phone call. And besides, I don't know who's on the other end of it, and I am only hearing one side of it. I want to hear both, so put it on speaker, would you? <laughs> you just go ahead, put it on speaker, lay it down, and we'll eat. And as the conversation's going on, we'll get a four-way conference call going with whoever's, whoever's there. But sometimes we get this. Have you, ever, have you ever been in the bathroom or the shower? And all of a sudden, you're in the bathroom or the shower, and somebody comes to the door. And you think, well, should I answer that or should I not? I don't know. What, a, what an interruption, right? By the time I get dressed and everything else and get pre presentable, in, in my case, it may take a while. To get to the door, they're already gone, right? And you think, okay, that really messed up my life and my days. Or you get these things like maybe you're working. And if you ever felt like that at the end of the day, you look back at what you've accomplished and you say, I've accomplished absolutely nothing. Because it seemed like every time I got right in the middle of something, somebody interrupted me. It seemed like I got right in the middle and somebody called me. It seemed like I got right in the middle and the boss comes over and wants something else. And I look back at the end of the day of everything that I had to do on my to-do list, and guess what I've got for tomorrow? I just copy and paste. Because I didn't get one thing accomplished all day, and this whole day was a failure. So what happens is... 
These, ladies and gentlemen, are opportunities for patience in learning. Do you remember the little lullaby that now I lay me down to sleep and I pray the Lord my soul to keep and if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to, soul to take. You know how long it took him to write those four lines? Seven years. It took him seven years to write this. You want to know why? They say they, that they think he kept falling asleep at the piano. <laughs> Give maybe a note, you know, and it would, it would just, just go. But can I tell you that even Jesus had to deal with disruptions? As a matter of fact, Jesus was busy teaching one day. And he's teaching to a bunch of people and sharing with them about God. And all of a sudden, here comes a bunch of children right in the middle of my sermon. And the disciples, what did they say? Lord, let's send them away. Let's send them away because God, or Lord, we know these kids they're not going to understand what you're talking about, and they're disrupting. Listen, man, we've been watching you. You got this crowd on the seat, and then, Lord, we got them right now to maybe where they're going to listen to you, and all of a sudden, here comes this great disruption of kids. And what did Jesus say? Don't you send them away. You leave them right here. And what did he do? He used that distraction and that interruption to teach them a lesson on patience. So many times we believe that interruptions that come into our lives are there to do something bad to us. And let me say this to you. There are times that God puts interruptions in your life to teach you patience. Sometimes you're going a little bit too quick and he's saying slow down here. And we don't listen. And then every once in a while, signs start showing up and everything begins to happen. And we need to understand that interruptions in your life, ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand this. They are divinely planned to give you patience. And that's what we don't understand. We only stand under, understand a little bit about this and a smidget, and we don't have the big picture of what God is. Number two is inconveniences. You want to talk about inconveniences? Here's Mary and Martha, okay? Remember the story? Jesus comes to their house, and Mary gets ticked off. <coughs> Lord, listen, you're a guest, and we owe you a lunch here. And Lord, every time you come and we want to feed you, I'm slaving over this hot stove or, or fire. They didn't have stoves back then. <laughs> I'm slaving over this big kettle, and she's sitting at your feet. Would you please tell her to get up and help me. And Jesus was telling us, listen, that sometimes we need to understand that sometimes the things that really irritate us the most is when we feel that other people are not holding up to their responsibility. Boy, don't we get ticked off. The boss comes around and pats them on the back and who did all the work? Yeah. Way to go, boss. You brown noser. See if I help you again. And so we get these 
inconveniences. But can I tell you something? Chrysler, a few years back, did a study. And they asked their customers of their cars that they made, what is your number one complaint with our cars? It wasn't the motor, the in engine, or anything else. It was certain things about their cars that would cause them inconvenience. It may be that the window wouldn't roll down, or the button was here, or the button was there, or certain things that were going on. And we need to understand, we want everything to go smoothly. So, I went to find some stories to go along with some of these, and, and I got a whole repertoire of stories. So this morning I'm going to tell you true life stories from other pastors of their life. Listen to this one. This one's stated, a month ago on Memorial Day weekend, after church, my wife was going to another, to another part of the, of the state to speak in, at a woman's group, at a woman's group. And I told my kids, let's go to Disneyland right after church. So, they had passes that the church had graciously given them to go to Disneyland for their 10th anniversary. He said, we headed up there, and he said, and I wore them out. Disneyland wasn't very full that day for some reason, and we rode everything. And at 10 o'clock that night, I had three very tired kids, four, eight, and 10 years of age. We're getting ready to leave, and then all of a sudden, I realized I lost my keys. He says, we go to the lost and found, and they say, don't worry, be happy. If you just wait and be patient until we close at midnight, then everything gets turned in. So we waited another two hours. We're about the last people to leave. They're closing. We go to the lost and found, and they say, they're not here. By this time, it's too late to call a car rental place. They're all closed. My wife is in Northern California with the other set of keys, and she's not supposed to be back till Tuesday, and this is Sunday. They shut the gates. We're standing out at the Disneyland parking lot. Three very tight kids, one very unhappy dad. And I said, okay, mom's not coming back until Tuesday. We'll just walk over to the Disneyland Hotel. We'll spend the night there. I got a visa. I reached in my pocket and I realized I left my wallet in the car. <laughs> now, I've got no money, no car, no wife, no friends. He said, that weekend at 2 in the morning, it started raining. We're standing there, empty parking lot, 1 in the morning. One lone cabbie comes through, driving through. We find it, we, we find, frantically wave him down and they say, sir, how much would it cost to take a cab to Laguna uh, Nigel where he lived? The cabbie said, $40. He says, deal. I reached in my pocket. He said, I knew I had a few bucks in cash. And guess what? I had exactly $40. We drive home. He lets us out about 2 in the morning. It's pouring down rain now. We tell him thank you. Then I realize I don't have keys to the house. <laughs> Everything's locked up. But we walk around and back and find a kitchen window open and there's a dowel in it. I squeeze my four-year-old through the window and he lets us in. We go to sleep. Mom's not coming back till Tuesday. We'll take it easy, sleep in late. Nine the next morning, Josh, my 10-year-old, comes in. Dad, I'm scared. Somebody's breaking in the back window. I said, nah. And then he and then realized somebody's breaking in. I start back. Josh was following. He says, every, every Saturday night, we play WWF wrestling. And that's what it was back at that time. Now it's WWE, okay? They had to change it. My two boys, four and eight, are tag team against me. I'm the ultimate pastor, and their title is the powerful PKs. If I, if I pin them, I read the Bible to them. If they pin me, they take an offering. So Josh was following me down the hall, and who do I see crawling in, soaking wet through the window? My wife. <laughs> She's decided to come home a day early. 
She drives straight through the night. She's given her keys to the house to the babysitter. There's no car in the driveway, so she doesn't think anybody's home. So she comes around back, climbs in the window, and as, as she was getting in, she heard rumbling and thought there was a, a burglar inside. But she's kind of halfway in and halfway out. <laughs> Didn't know what to do. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an inconvenience. So let's talk about irritations. Remember the story of Moses? How Moses was out in the wilderness for 40 years in the desert and 2 million people complaining. I don't know about y'all, but it's hard enough when you only got one person complaining. Now you got 2 million of these people just complaining about everything. Lord, there's, there's no food, there's no this, there's no that. I mean, it's hot out here. We'd be better off back there. At least we had a place to stay. We, we had plenty of food. We knew what was going to happen tomorrow. We just didn't care. And so all of a sudden, they're, and they're ungrateful. And Moses had enough. He is tired of their ungratefulness. And what did Moses do? He disobeyed God. He struck the rock. And guess what? That irritation kept him out of the promised land because he struck it. But can I tell you something? It's the little things in life that annoy us the most, not the big things. It's like when you're going into, and I don't know if... Um, if you've ever been into uh, New York and in a, in a taxi cab. And this pastor one time was riding in the back of the, of the taxi cab and he asked, this, he asked this question of the cabbie. He says that it's the little things. He says, I asked the taxi cab, what does he enjoy about his day of being a taxi cab. And here's what he said. It's not the driving that I enjoy. It's the people that I run over. <laughs> now let me ask you this question. What is it easier to sit on? A mountain or a thumbtack? Which causes you the most pain? To sit on top of the mountain or to sit on a thumbtack? A thumbtack. That's what we're trying to tell you. It's the little things that irritate us the most. You get, you get a little splinter in your finger or worse, get a thing up underneath your finger or a splinter up underneath your fingernail. You talk about painful. That hurts. And, tr and then trying to get in there and dig that thing out. By the time you get done, it's like you just want to cut your hand off. And sometimes we don't understand that it's these little things of, of irritations Okay, and then the last thing is inactivity, and, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish with uh, my formula for this, okay? Why? Inactivity, when you, when you begin to look and, and see, because in life, uh, there's a sign, and, and this is a sign that you probably need to print out, and it's called patience carries a lot of weight, not W-E-I-G-H-T, W-A-I-T. Right. Patience carries a lot of weight. In order to learn patience, you've got to learn how to wait. And that's what God is trying to show us. Here's a typical day that a pastor gave me. Here's his illustration. You leap out of bed, 
You zip in and out of the shower, you bolt down your breakfast, you gulp down your coffee, you rush off to work. You run through your schedule in a staff meeting, your boss tells you, tells you to hustle on that sale or get in, in gear regarding these changes that you're supposed to make. Step on it, completing the project, scramble to close the deal. His closing words are get the lead out of your pants. So you dash out to lunch where you wolf down a sandwich, you hurry back to the office where you dash out some letters, rip through a stack of return phone calls, and get cracking on those assignments that you attend to wrap up. At five, you, uh, you foot it out of there, you race home to dinner in rush hour traffic, and finally, you dart in the front door, you drop dead, and at night you pray, Lord, I need patience and hurry up, give it to me now. <laughs> that is our day. And so what do we do? Have, have you ever been in a building and this building has got 40 stories and two elevators? If you ever want to see patients, stand and wait for an elevator. You will find real quick who the patient person is. Watch. Here's generally what happens. I push the button. Two seconds, the elevator ain't there. <laughs> and then the elevator comes. And we get in the elevator, and what do we do? Push that button. Somebody gets in there, what do we do? I'm pushing my floor, get your hand out of here. <laughs> I waited longer than you. If you really wanna know, because have you ever watched, honestly, have you ever really seen when people stand still, they can't stand it? They gotta do something. Inactivity kills us. We've got to do something, do something, do something. You, you, you know, it's like you're sitting in traffic, right? And you look in front of you and everybody's out of their cars. And you start laying on your horn. Buddy, move it! I can't. Look at this person in front of me. And you're wanting somebody to do, you just got to do something. You can't sit there. You, you know? And, well, sometimes you don't want to turn on the radio or turn on the car because, especially if you're out in California, because you may run out of gas. And that's the worst thing in the world is be in the middle of a traffic jam and your car runs out of gas. It's like, can I take my plates off so that nobody knows and they can't know that it was me? It, do I have a change of clothes? Do I have a in my car? So nobody will know that it's me because I know that if I get out of this car and, and it runs out, that there's going to be a camera on channel 5 or channel 9 or channel 2 or 12 or whatever, and they're going to be filming me, and I'm going to make the 11 o'clock news headlines. Car runs out of gas in the middle of traffic jam. <laughs> Really, do you think your life is that important? That you're going to be the news? But we do, and we, and we don't want to do this. Okay, so let's talk about how do I do this? we got to discover. Discover a bigger perspective. And I'll go through these real quickly. Proverbs 19.11 says this. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is his glory to overlook an offense. We got to discover a bigger perspective, okay? So, I made a list of my pet peeves. Getting bumped from an airline due to overbooking. I don't like that. Because most of the time, if I'm on that flight, I'm on that flight for a reason because I'm getting ready to go to a cruise. And the first time that I was getting ready to go on that cruise, we almost missed it because we couldn't get on that flight. So I learned, fly in the night before, then I don't have to worry about it. Number two, 
Cereal boxes that don't reseal. <laughs> okay? And, and, and here's another one. And, and I'm, I'm not stereotyping, but fast food clerks that don't understand English. <laughs> what would you like? I would like a number two. You want a number two? <laughs> I want a number two. What is that number two? It's a Big Mac meal, and, and, I, and I get a Whopper. <laughs> and I understand I'm at the wrong place. <laughs> Another pet peeve of mine is malls that don't open up until 10 o'clock. I don't know about y'all, but I hate sleeping in. Mark is learning out how to sleep, how to get this, okay? Dave and I are training him. He, he is getting into training. I, I, wrote, I wrote Dave a note. I said, you need to talk to Mark. He's slipping because two days this week, he was not in here until after 11. And so what do we do? We made him get up at, and be here at 8 o'clock yesterday morning to go to the fair. And, and now he's back here. And, and so we got to figure out something to do tomorrow. No, but malls that don't open until 10 o'clock. I don't know about y'all, but I am up and ready to go. And if I'm going to go shopping for something, I know what it is, where I'm going to go get it, and I want to get it and get out. I do not want to have to wait four hours of my day to wait to go get something that I need. Okay? Another one, nails that bend over when you hit them. <laughs> That is the worst thing in the world and whoever made those things. When you hit a nail, it's supposed to go in. I hate it when a nail goes, oh, bends over, especially when it's almost in and then it bends. And then you got to sit there and try and pull it out. And you realize you're trying to drive it into a knot. And last but not least, one of my pet peeves is doctor's waiting rooms. I'm going to pay you $150 to sit in a chair <laughs> for 45 minutes and you're going to talk to me for five seconds. How are you doing, Mr. Cotton? I'm doing fine. You need any other medications refilled? No? Okay, I'll see you in six months. <laughs> and then I get a note. That, well, man, this is really the next one to burnt me, okay? I get a note this week that my doctor's who I go to at Westchester that are part of the UC physicians, I got a bill, generally I got a bill just for the doctor, and that covered it all. And now they're telling me, Mr. Cotton, effective this date, uh, here's what you're gonna do, you're now gonna get two bills, one for the hospital, because they're part of the hospital now, and another one for this. And I'm thinking, man, how much do I have to pay? Now I've gotta pay $450 to sit there and wait for 45 minutes for you to meet you for five seconds, for you to tell me that I don't need any other medication, and, I'm fine and, and I'll see you in six months. <laughs> Boom. I got patience. <laughs> <laughs> but can I, can I give you a little hint? For those of you that are married, the secret to longevity in the marriage is to learn to see your spouse's perspective on something. If you're always looking at it from your perspective, you're not going to learn patience. But let me say this to you. If you really want to learn how to have patience in your marriage, look at things from their perspective. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to change, but at least you understand where they're coming from. And that's, that's good, okay? It's the same thing that if you're, if you're going into business or whatever else, you're going to have to learn how to see things from the customer's point of view. And sometimes we don't like the customer's point of view, but sometimes that's what happens. Even as a pastor, sometimes 
when somebody says that they're leaving the church and, 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 and they'll be honest with you and sit down and ask them why, and they, they'll tell you why, and being honest about it, then you look at it and say, okay, do they really have a point here? And look at it from their point of view. Because maybe there's something that you're doing that, that you're not understanding that you're doing and you don't see it. Okay, so anyway, patience starts with wisdom. Number two is you need to develop a sense of humor. Okay? Let me say this to you. I am convinced, I am totally convinced that the reason that most Christians have issues is most Christians have no clue how to have fun. They have no idea. You, you get out with a bunch of Christians and say, okay, let's go have fun. They say, okay, let's get out the Bible. Let's play Bible trivia. I, I'll tell you right now, I will lose every game of Bible trivia ever out there. I'm not into Bible trivia. I'm into the Bible, okay? But I also understand, like when I was growing up, we wanted, we wanted to play cards, okay? And I don't know about y'all, but playing cards can be fun. Just as long as you don't catch somebody cheating, okay? <laughs> playing with the cheaters is no fun. This is when we want to do the OK Corral and shoot them, right? But there are times, um, for instance, and, and most of y'all know I'm a prankster. And I love to prank with people, OK? Now, I don't want, I don't want to do a prank to hurt anybody, except a few. There might be exceptions. But it was like, I think I, I shared this with you. Linda has decided that she loves to prank me, okay? And, and so, uh, so I, I, went, uh, I went somewhere, and, and, I, and I came back. And, and when I came back, I, I mean, my whole office is filled with balloons. But the problem is they didn't fill the balloons with helium. They were blowing them up. Linda and, and her girls and Lisa, okay? They were blowing them up with air and then they went and got an air compressor. Mark gave them this bright idea. You can fill them up fast, faster. And so he was in on it too, okay? So I walk in and the whole floor is filled with balloons. Helium would float. These are there. I can't walk in with these balloons, because I do not like busting balloons. I hate the sound. And then I hate picking up the residue that whatever's left, because you have no clue where it's going to. So anyway, they did that, and then I went on another trip, and I came back, and they thought, okay, we're gonna go prank again. So I go up to the door, and there's two empty pitchers with a note on the door to the office that says, you might need these. <laughs> okay, what's up? I open the door and I look and there's cups from the door all the way to the stairs. No place to walk. And I'm too old to climb over that desk. Okay, that does not going to cut it. Because I was the only one here, nobody else to call 911 when I fell. So I look and sure enough, the first cup had a little bit of water. So here I am. I don't believe this. working my way up. I'm thinking, this is stupid. I know what I'll do. I'll pick the cups up as many as I can in my hand. And I'll take them over to her room. And I'll sit them right in front of the door. So she can't get in her room. So I move them over there and the pictures that I had the water in, I left in, I left in plain view on the table that she would see these with the cups, thinking that I was stupid enough to empty all those cups and put them in there. <laughs> Prankters, pranksters always have agenda. So she goes to open the door and she looks and she says, I don't believe this. I have to clean up my own prank. 
I'm laughing my butt off. I think that is hilarious. And I'm sitting there watching her clean it up. <laughs> Christians need to develop a sense of humor, ladies and gentlemen. That is how you learn patience. I could have sat there that whole time getting frustrated with every cup, and I thought, no, I'm going to get the last laugh on this one. I'm going to watch her clean up her mess. <laughs> so if you decide to prank me, be careful, okay? Um, I won't give you that story. Number three is you got to deepen your love. First Corinthians 13. Uh, 13 4 says love is patient again what did I tell you when I'm impatient I'm unloving listen let me say this to you as much as I can when you are filled with love ladies and gentlemen there is very little that's going to irritate you it may be for a moment and it goes away you don't sit there and think about it and think about it and think about it and, and you go on because let me say this to you impatience says more about you than it does the other person And so many times, what we need to under, understand is this. If I really want to deepen my love, here's sometimes what I, I try my best to do, but it doesn't always work, okay? And, and I'm not always good at this. I could help you understand the formula, and sometimes I miss the formula. But if you think of all of these little irritants as heavenly sandpaper, then you'll learn to be patient. Sandpaper is there to rub off the things to make them smooth. And what happens is a lot of times these irritants come into our life where God is trying to use these irritants to smooth off some roughness that needs to be smooth, some other spots that need to be so that we can learn patience. Because let me say this to you, you don't know what's coming next down the road. You don't know what's around the next bend. You don't know how much that that rubbing of that sandpaper helped smooth up or off so that it became a little bit easier. So sometimes when we think that people are irritants, we need to think, God, I don't know what's next, you do. You're trying to smooth something off here and teach me patience. God, thank you for the heavenly sandpaper you sent my way today. I appreciate it. And I'll learn from it. And number four, and I'll finish with this, is instead of depending on your power, you need to depend upon the power of God. Amen. Colossians says this, may he strengthen you with his glorious might, with ample power, to meet whatever comes with fortitude, patience, and joy. So, why did we spend the whole day, this whole morning, talking about patience? Let me give you some examples that I found out of the Bible. Noah had to wait 120 years before the boat started floating. Abraham had to wait 90 years before he finally got the son that God had promised him. All of the great saints of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, had to go through the school of waiting. It didn't just come to it. And so let me say this to you. It's going to be the same way for you, okay? So, here's your assignment for the week as we finish. Number one, 
Say, Lord, help me to understand. Lord, help me to understand. Understanding will help me get a bigger perspective on what's going on here instead of this. Number two, God help me develop a greater sense of humor. Number three, help me to really love these people. And number four, help me to depend upon your power to be patient. Because God, I don't know what's coming down tomorrow. You do. You do. So, my question to you is, you say you got faith? The acid test to how much faith you got is what happens when the rubber hits the road and you get hit with some inconveniences, some interruptions, some irritations, and some activity, inactivity. What do you do? That shows your faith. You may say, Pastor, I got lots of faith, okay? Let's talk about what happened yesterday. Let's talk about the day before. Let's talk about the day before that. How did you handle that situation? How you handle that situation shows how much faith you got. And there are times, I have to tell you, I wish I could always stand up and be proud and say, oh, I did a great job. But there are times, man, I failed. And there are times I had to get down and say, God, I, I am so sorry. You meant this for my good. And God, I didn't learn. But Father, with, when and if this comes back around, Help me not to respond the same way that I responded the first time. The first time, ladies and gentlemen, when the thing comes around and you don't hit it right, that's a choice. The second time when it comes around and you do the exact same thing, that's not a choice, that's a pattern that says you are developing a pattern that needs to be changed. It's no longer a choice. First time we choose. The second time we already knew what we did the first time was wrong. We, so we're not choosing, we're, we're in a pattern now, we're stuck. And the third time we'll do the same thing, and the fourth time, and the fifth time, and the sixth time. And then we keep wondering, God, why do I keep getting the same situation over and over and over again? Why? Because I never made the right choice in the first place. And he's trying to deepen my faith. He's trying to make me strong, not weaker. And there are times we're going to get hit with some huge stuff. And there are times we're going to get hit with little stuff. The huge stuff, a lot of times we handle pretty good. Because we know there's nothing we can do about it. We got to depend on him. But it's the little stuff that we fail so much with because we let that control us. And when God says, no, let me control it, I'm here. So this morning, I don't know where you're at. Only you do. Number one, you are the only one that knows if you've got a true relationship with the Father through the Son. Only you. And if you don't have that, then you have no clue what I'm talking about this morning. Number two, maybe you do have a relationship with him. But that relationship needs to be deepened. Your patience needs to grow. And maybe you're at a point where you're saying, God, I need you right now more than ever. Because God, there's some patience I need to learn right now. And maybe you just want to come to him and talk to him and pray. It's here. Maybe you're here and you'd like to come join this church by letter, by statement, by baptism. Come on. As they sing. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. 
First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you. Go